Yes. Can you hear me now? Is it good? Okay, so thank you very much. So presence and absence of women in early modern handwritten news, random box in the Medici archive. So on this painting, you can see Maria Magdalena of Austria and her son. She was born in 1589, just a few hundred meters from the place where we are now. She was born in the castle of Graz. We can simply say that she was the poster girl of her social milieu. Her father, the Duke of Austria, was a member of the House of Habsburgs. When she was 19, she married Cosimo de' Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. She moved to Florence, and in eight years, she had eight children. After eight years of marriage, her husband passed away, and she became the regent. She died relatively early, when she was only 42. The received wisdom is that she had a short but very happy life. The question naturally arises, what did she do all day? How did she spend her time? And there is a later exchange between Medici officials that sheds light on an everyday activity she apparently really loved. So, today after dining, the most serene art duchess, Maria Maddalena of Austria, our ladyships, wants to hear the reading of the newsletter, a viso from Venice. And her, her most serene highness will be pleased if your lordship will secure the delivery of every week, writing to this effect to that friend, so that he might say how much he is to be given annually. <coughs> so Maria Maddalena read handwritten newsletters. And this is nothing surprising. She did actually what many of her contemporaries did. In early modern Europe, aristocrats, court officials, merchants were eager to gather handwritten newsletters. Generally, throughout the 16th and the 17th century, there was a very intense circulation of handwritten news sheets or newsletters. These handwritten newsletters, of these in Italian or Zeitung in German, were produced by semi-professional and professional news agents, such as, for instance, postmasters, spies, and diplomats. These news agents collected all sorts of information from a great variety of sources. They often translated them and compiled handwritten newsletters, and then sold them to European courts, aristocrats, and merchants. These handwritten newsletters were the predecessors of modern printed news. Interestingly, throughout the 17th century, handwritten newsletters coexisted with printed news. A handwritten newsletter is usually a sequence of eight, ten single news items that are organized into separate paragraphs. So at this point, uh, we have another question that I think somewhat naturally arises. How often did Maria Magdalena and her contemporaries read about women in these handwritten newsletters? And answering this question is not at all straightforward. So why not? First, because most of the once existing newsletters got lost. They are not available anymore. So we need to deal with a lost hole. Second, the newsletters that are available today seem to be random samples from this lost hole. For instance, in the Florentine State Archive, where the former Medici Archive is preserved, there are thousands of newsletters today, but they are definitely not, not all newsletters that once reached the Medici court. There are enormous gaps. And now we reach the main question of, of today's talk. How to estimate the presence of women in the lost hole based on an existing random sample? So the next slide is just giving you uh, an outline of the itinerary we will do in the next uh, 15 minutes. And first of all, let's see the random sample I worked with. So I worked with a corpus of uh, 1,200 uh, hundreds of newsletters from the Florentine State Archive. The newsletters were compiled in the 16th and the 17th century. They were digitized and transcribed by the Euronews project of the University College Corp. They were compiled in the large urban centers of early modern Europe. They contain both local news from the place of compilation and the international news. Most of them are anonymous, so the news agents who created them are unknown. So again, how can we use this sample of handwritten newsletters to estimate the presence of women in the totality of once existing early modern newsletters in the period? So, first of all, Let's work a bit with, uh, with the concept of randomness, and what, what is this random sample? 
So those of you who have worked in archives already have a taste or feeling of randomness and archives. You go to an archive, you ask for a box, and uh, what you will find in that box is totally unpredictable. And based on your finding in that box, you establish some sort of evidence. Then you ask for the next box, and it happens that what you find in this box undermines the evidence you had from the previous box, and so on. So when you do an archival research, there is this constant change, unpredictability, and fluidity of evidence. Uh, so I, let's simulate the randomness of archives with a simple thought experiment. So we have a robot, which is literally a random walker. It keeps wandering in the physical spaces where the former Medici archive is today housed. Furthermore, it randomly opens boxes and folders containing early modern handwritten newsletters. It reads them, and it checks whether women are mentioned or not. Now, of course, wandering around in the Florentine State Archive for thousands of hours and randomly opening boxes and folders is not viable. Instead, we can simulate the random walker by using the previously presented Medici News corpus. So let's simulate it. I implemented uh, the algorithm, and uh, today I, I will not speak at all about uh, the algorithm itself, but I'm happy to, to discuss it later. So this is something very simple. It's coming, okay. So our robot randomly selects the news sheets and checks whether a woman is mentioned or not. Look at the outcome, it can be absence or presence. And as you can see, the outcome is always changing. Sometimes, sometimes women are present, sometimes they are absent. And as the robot discovers the archive, no stable truth is emerging. There is a kind of fluidity, unpredictability, which are in the very heart of randomness. So what shall we do at this point? How can we discover something stable? So let's redesign the thought experiment and let's give some new tasks and assignments to our robot. Okay. So the new tasks are select randomly 100 news items at once. Again, uh, a news sheet is a sequence of news items. Report us in how many news items you found a woman mentioned. And repeat this until you have seen all possible combinations of news items. Now, this is a very, very long shot. Uh, uh, the number of possible combinations is practically infinite. So our robot will walk around for a very long time. And in addition to this, we also give another task to the random walker. Oops. <coughs> so we ask him to monitor the process in the following way. After each, random, uh, after each round of random selection, calculate the average number of news items that have so far been mentioned, that have so far mentioned women. Say in the first round there were 40 news items mentioning women, in the second round there were 60, and our random walker will report to us uh, after the second round 50. It's simple. So with this, we will learn how the mean probability is changing if 100 news items are randomly selected. Now, to help you to understand the entire process, here is a, a visual summary. Okay. Okay, so select 100 news items, report the probability of women mentioned, repeat this until all combinations are seen, and after each round, calculate the mean probability. So let's simulate all these, and this time let's focus on the development of the mean probability. So as you can see, at the beginning, the mean probability of hearing about a woman is changing. There are a lot of oscillations. But then, something remarkable is happening. The mean probability is not changing anymore. It's becoming stable. It's flat. So what, what is happening here? Why, why is this flat now? Uh, did it get lost in the archive? Uh, we have not even seen the one percentage of all possible combinations. Okay, uh, so this procedure, by the way, is called bootstrapping or random sampling with replacement. It's not my own invention. It has been around for 30, 40 years, I guess. So after circa 10,000 uh, rounds of randomly selected news items, our robot saw everything it could see. 
It could continue the random selection process forever, but nothing would change. The mean probability of finding women mentioned in 100 randomly selected news items is 0.14. And the mean probability, if we look at the entire news sheets, is around 0.7. So at this point, we have two questions. Why did we do all this random walk? Why do we need it? And, and, and what, what do we actually learn with it? So, remember, newsletters in the Medici archive are just a random sample of all previously existed newsletters. It is just one possible snapshot with its own bias. By randomly reshuffling, we look at this snapshot from all possible angles. And we collect systematic evidence. We calculate a probability value that holds true even in tens of thousands of random subsamples. So after this, uh, let's return to the original problem set and let's see where we are now with the itinerary. Okay. Uh, so we learned that the mean probability of finding a woman mentioned in 100 randomly selected news items is around 15. We learned that the mean probability in case of an entire news sheet is around 0 0.7. So how to get from here to the lost corpus of all news sheets that once existed? So to, to resolve this, let's get into dirty business and uh, let's create a fake coin. And I would need a volunteer, so I, someone could come here, please. Volunteer, please. Please. <laughs> I need a... Okay. So we'll try to make it larger. Yes. Okay. So, you can create a fake, a fake coin. Uh, you have to write a number here between 0 and 100. And uh, don't tell it to anyone, the number. Okay, you just write a number here, whatever it, you want. Okay, and then we press enter. And now we are trying to find out the, the probability of head as she set, up, as she set it up. So what we do is that we are flipping the coin for 100 times, and after that we will make some calculations and try to come up with an estimate. And let's hope that it will be correct. Okay, so this is the, uh, the result. Is the probability of head between 61 and 76 or somewhere very close? Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good, okay. Okay, so let's go back now to the, to the slideshow. And, and let's see the assumptions with, we, with, I work, with which we worked. So we worked with a, with a core assumption. So whatever we see throughout the flipping, that is conditioned by the prior probability of head as set up by our volunteer. For instance, if the head is set to 0 0.2, then it is very unlikely that the flipping will result in 0 0.8. And Bayesian statistics offers a formalized and mathematically rigorous procedure to estimate this prior, as set up by her, based on the evidence, which is the flipping. And this formalized procedure is called Bayesian inference or Bayesian update. And it consists of the following steps. So as a first step, we set an initial and temporary prior assumption. The probability of head is 0 0.5. As a second step, we collected evidence by flipping the coin. As a third step, we updated or modified the temporary prior based on the evidence we collected. And uh, I would like to emphasize that this is a very, very gentle description of a relatively complex mathematical procedure, uh, which you can find a, a, a more elaborate description in the abstract. And, and there is a very, one very important point. The result is not a given number. It is an estimate represented through a probability distribution. And that is what you saw at the end of the flo uh, flo coin flipping here. This is the, the distribution. <coughs> so this procedure was applied to estimate the presence of, a, of the women in the lost corpus of early modern handwritten newsletters. Okay, let's see the core assumption I, I worked with. So the news sheets in the Medici archive are a sample from the lost hall. 
Hence, whatever we see in the Medici archive, that is conditioned by the lost hall. For instance, if the probability of women's presence in the lost corpus is 0.1, then it is very, very unlikely that we will get 0.8 in the, in the Medici archive. So again, to estimate the prior based on the evidence, we can use the procedure of Bayesian update. <coughs> so our uh, prior belief was that, that the probability of women's presence in the lost corpus is 50%. Next, we collected some evidence with the help of the random walk. Finally, we updated the prior belief about the lost corpus based on the evidence we collected. Okay, so now on this slide you can see the, the entire journey we did. The bootstrapping and then getting the mean probability and then doing the Bayesian update or Bayesian inference. So now let's see the results and what we learned about the presence of women in the lost corpus of early modern handwritten newsletters. <coughs> so I studied women's presence in early modern handwritten newsletters on two different levels. First, I studied women's presence on the levels of news items. Again, a newsletter is a consecutive sequence of eight, ten news items. So how often did early modern news readers encounter women in the news items? Well, the plot gives a, uh, an explicit answer, not very often. As you can see, it's, it's much closer to the, to the absence. <coughs> Generally, the presence of women in early modern news was rare. The early modern news world was overly male-dominated. The most important actors were kings, emperors, princes, noblemen, churchmen, diplomats, and officials. By contrast, hearing about women in news was significantly less likely. I also investigated whether the presence of women increased over time. This investigation uncovered that over time, the presence of women did not change significantly. Similarly, I could not find any significant variation when I compared news sheets that came from different locations of early modern Europe. Finally, I also studied the social status of women mentioned in the news. This uncovered that news overwhelmingly discussed women of higher social status. So the handwritten news world was not only male-dominated, but also elitist. And now we go to the second level of entire news sheets. So at the same time, it is important to emphasize that there was no complete silence about women in early modern handwritten news. The probability that a woman will be mentioned in an entire news sheet is between 0.6 and 0.8. Consequently, early modern news readers did not get much news about women, but they were likely to hear about at least one woman when they read an entire news sheet. Now, as a short conclusion, uh, today I presented how Bayesian statistics can help address a fundamental problem of history. This is the loss of historical sources and the incompleteness of our archival collections. Interestingly, Bayesian statistics is a core pillar of our modern life. Without any exaggeration, I can say that everybody in this room draws on Bayesian statistics in almost every moment of her or his life. The GPS in your car relies on Bayesian statistics. When you talk over the phone, Bayesian statistics ensures that you can hear the voice of the person you talk to. The sensors in your fridge and laundry machine also rely on Bayesian statistics. When you watch TV, again, there is Bayesian statistics behind the scene since telecommunication systems use it to transmit information. So what is the connection between loss and incompleteness of historical data and these examples of modern life? Let's see, for instance, GPS. The signal that the GPS device gets is noisy, incomplete, and somewhat random. There is a lost hole. Still, you do not get lost yourself. And at the end, the information you get from your GPS is accurate. This is due to Bayesian information filters that help reconstruct the complete signal based on incomplete information. By the same token, as I presented today, Bayesian statistics can give insights into lost historical documents and, cope with the incom and help to cope with the incompleteness of our, archi uh, our cultural heritage. Thank you.